Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the June 2024 CT is Us quiz. Hard to imagine it's June already. The weather is getting warm, and it's going to get warmer. Our current fellows are going to be leaving soon, and we'll get a new crop of fellows. So June becomes a very much transition month in academic radiology, and hopefully some of you are beginning to take early summer vacation. So with that, let's get started with 10 excellent cases. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, what do I see? I see a large mass either arising from the kidney or pushing on the kidney. When you look at it, and I would like to see some coronal views, which I didn't give you here, you can see the extension up toward the liver, possibly involving the liver. And when you look, this process is in the peri and pararenal space. I do not believe this is a renal cell carcinoma, not a primary RCC. You could have metastatic melanoma. That's the second most common thing that occurs in the pararenal space. And although this is fairly extensive, occasionally melanoma can look like this, is not an abscess. This is one of the four or five classic appearances of lymphoma of the kidney. Remember, solitary masses in the kidney, multiple masses, typically bilateral, involvement of the adenopathy in the periodic region with direct extension into the kidney, and peri and pararenal space involvement, very nicely shown in this example. This is bulkier than we typically see, but is a very classic appearance. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, well, we see a large around seven centimeter right adrenal mass, which has impressive vascularity in its periphery. So what could this be? To me, the most likely diagnosis, or at least I'm thinking about a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma, and in fact, that's what this ended up being. But occasionally it can be pheos, which can be cystic. Pheos are typically vascular above 120 Hounsfield units, can go up to almost 300 Hounsfield units, and that is a possibility. Metastatic renal cell carcinoma, if the patient had a renal cell met to the adrenal gland, are very vascular, usually not as large, usually they're bilateral, but it's a thought. The one thing this is not an, is an adenoma. You can have large adenomas, particularly adenomas that have had bleeding, but to have this kind of enhancement, that's just not going to be the case. Size over 4 cm, we think about, or 5 cm, we think about malignancy, but a third of lesions over 4 or 5 cm are benign. So size alone is not a criteria for calling something malignant, but surely in this case, the least likely diagnosis would be an adenoma. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, we see a mass at the level of the diaphragm going above and below the diaphragm. The mass is of lower CT attenuation, displacing rather than invading structures. We could think about lymphoma, but I don't see anything in the mediastinum or in the abdomen. That would be a funny looking lymphoma. Duplication cyst of what? I guess esophagus, bronchogenic cyst, but again, soft tissue density and going above and below the diaphragm would make it unlikely. Melanoma can cause all sorts of masses. I never can say something is not melanoma, but I don't see anything anywhere else. And this appearance would be very atypical. On the other hand, something along the paraspinal region, abutting the vessels, not so much displacing, extending above and below the diaphragm, pushing downward, is a very good appearance for a neurogenic tumor, and this was a neurofibroma. The most likely diagnosis in the 70 year old male is, well, we see a mass extending from middle to posterior mediastinum, which has calcification. It's somewhat cystic and solid, Lymphoma, unless it's been treated, typically doesn't have calcification. Thymomas can calcify. This is a terrible location for thymoma. Usually it's anterior mediastinum extending posteriorly, perhaps. So I would not like that as a diagnosis. We've seen things like chondrosarcomas and osteosarcomas as anterior mediastinal masses, but usually they're arising from the chest wall. So that's not my favorite. 
Teratoma, although anterior metastinum typically can occur in middle or posterior metastinum, teratomas have zones of decreased attenuation like fat, have calcifications. This was an unusual case because we don't see many teratomas in this location, and also we don't see many teratomas in 70-year-old males. What a great case. In this patient who's a renal transplant patient, the most likely diagnosis is, you can see what looks like airspace filling, and you can see very nicely uh, th th these filling defects within the airways, a really, really good example of this. And so what is this? This to me looks like it's infection, and it doesn't look like aspergillosis, which usually gives cavitary lesions and more solid lesions, not so diffuse. It's not the appearance of pulmonary edema. We always need to think of drug reaction, but this involves the entire lung, and that would not be a really good appearance for drug reaction. And in this renal transplant patient, the most likely diagnosis is going to be CMV infection. CMV infection commonly occurs in patients with renal transplant. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, what do you see? You see cystic spaces on the axial and coronal views. The rest of the lungs look pretty good. There's no consolidation. There's no infiltrate. This is not the appearance of emphysema. These are too well-defined and abut the vessels. It's not the appearance of sarcoid and septic emboli are peripheral, the cavitary. You see soft tissue components to it. This is lymph angioliomyomatosis, LAM. It's a classic appearance. Lymph angioliomyomatosis is a rare lung disease that affects mainly women of childbearing age. Uh, in patients who have LAM, abnormal muscle-like cells begin to grow out of control in the lungs and other parts of the body. Over time, these LAM cells can destroy healthy lung tissue. As a result, fluid-filled pockets called cysts may develop, preventing air from moving freely in and out of the lungs. This can lower the amount of oxygen that reaches the rest of the body. There are two types of LAM, one associated with tuberous sclerosis as part of the TSC complex, and then probably more commonly sporadic LAM. So a very, very specific diagnosis. Patients with LAM also can have, as part of the tuberous sclerosis complex, uh, renal angiomyolipomas. The most likely diagnosis in this case is when you look at the axial images, you could think about an intramural hematoma, even considered the section. You could think about malignancy, perhaps there are nodes in the mediastinum infiltrating like melanoma, though this kind of looks more infiltrating around the vessel, but things like lymphoma and melanoma could be considered. But then when you look at the abdominal CT, you see something infiltrating in the peri and pararenal space. So again, you might say, well, maybe this is lymphoma involving chest abdomen. That's a possibility. But the, the infiltration is so extensive, and the infiltration of the aorta is a bit atypical. This, however, is a classic appearance for ernheim chester disease. It's a form of vasculitis. Patients classically get this perirenal involvement. They classically get the changes around the aorta. They get changes in long bones as well, which can be hot on PET scan. It's a very important diagnosis because this can be treated with different agents, including methotrexate. If not, it goes undiagnosed and the patient can have all sorts of multi-organ involvement. So a very important diagnosis and very classic CT appearance. The most likely diagnosis in this case if you look at this patient, there's a soft tissue mass adjacent to the right side of the aorta, which tracks upward posteriorly in posterior metastinum and tracks down beneath the diaphragm. There also appears to be soft tissue in the region of the periaortic regions of the abdomen. So what could this be? Well, it's not going to be TB, right? TB can give you low-density areas, but this is more solid, and TB wouldn't be so extensive. This is not an aortic dissection, and it's not an intramural hematoma. 
This is abutting the vessels. It's not a vasculitis which involves the vessels. The best and most likely diagnosis in this case was lymphoma. Again, very impressive extension. Lymphoma can occur in any compartment in the mediastinum, but can occur only in the posterior mediastinum in this case. We also think in posterior mediastinum about neurogenic tumors. Can this be something like a neurofibroma or some other neurogenic tumors? It could be, but the extent and the homogeneous components is more likely going to push us to lymphoma, which is the correct answer. In this patient with back pain, what's the most likely diagnosis? What you can see is destruction of the lower thoracic and upper lumbar vertebral bodies. There's at least three vertebral bodies involved. There's a diffuse collapse, irregularity, and there's a paraspinal soft tissue mass. This is not the appearance of trauma. Metastatic disease to the spine can have many different appearances, but the soft tissue mass and the appearance of bone is not really the classic appearance of metastasis, particularly since the rest of the bones look good. Myeloma, again, can cause focal disease, can have a paraspinal mass, can involve single or multiple vertebral bodies. So I guess that's in the differential diagnosis. But in this patient, parastinal mass with bone destruction, with this irregularity and kind of the wedging, you got to think about infection. It could be E. coli infection or TB. And in this case, it was TB with osteomyelitis, with soft tissue mass and destruction of vertebral bodies. A really nice example. In this patient with hematuria, the most likely diagnosis is, well, this is a pretty straightforward case. Solid mass, upper pole, left kidney, mildly vascular. It could be lymphoma. That's a possibility. It could be meds to the kidney. That's definitely a possibility. Abscess, that's not a possibility. And if I said least likely, Lead diagnosis, then abscess would come out very well. This most likely is going to be and was a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. I show you this case in part because we always think about clear cells as being very vascular, average attenuation of around 140 Hounsfield units, but typically over 100 Hounsfield units, but not always. The larger renal lesions are more likely clear cell than papillary but I want to make the point that papillaries can be large. So anyway, this was a clear cell RCC. Well, those are 10 cases. I hope you found them interesting. I hope you found them challenging. And I hope to see you here next month. Have a great day, everybody. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.